Um, so uh, we're going to talk about the um, return on investment that you can get from HEVC. Um, these are real life use cases. We're using real life numbers. Um, there's a lot of modeling that we'll see here. Some of it is simplistic just because, you know, we've got 40 minutes and five use cases to go through. If you have um, any disagreements with anything you see up here, and I'm sure there will be many, please feel free to call me out at any time. This is a discussion, you know, this is not me pontificating. Um, also, I tend to talk very fast when I'm excited, which is most of the time. So if I'm rattling on and you have no idea what I'm saying, just, you know, wave me down or um, my colleague Perry is here in the audience and, you know, his only job is to keep me talking slowly. So um, with that caveat, um, for those of you who weren't here last year, you know, we've been doing a series of talks on HEVC. My team at Frost & Sullivan covers a variety of markets on the enterprise side, which is house of worship, government, defense, education, as well as media and entertainment, and we cover it end to end. So from um, camera all the way to rendering, we do monetization, management, all of that. Um, why my opinion is somewhat reliable on HEVC um, is because I cover all the markets that you see circled there. Encoding, transcoding, monetization, and rendering. So it is based on an end-to-end -end view. And the analysis we have is derived from conversations with all the industry stakeholders. So it's a bottoms-up approach, and that's why it's proven fairly reliable over time. What we're going to talk about today is, um, just for those who may be new to HEVC or who weren't here last year, we're going to quickly breeze through the value proposition of HEVC, um, what's working today, what puzzle pieces are still missing, and what considerations you will have um, when crafting an ROI model for whether to invest in this or not. Um, we'll spend most of our time, as I said, on the real-life business cases, and then we'll run through the implications for um, encoder, transcoder vendors, as well as service providers who will be leveraging HEVC um, and some concluding thoughts. So um, the, the players in the HEVC ecosystem um, remain the same. You have the CE device manufacturers who will be playing back the HEVC content. You have the encoder, transcoder vendors who are helping generate the HEVC content. You have the pay TV service providers who are actually running the services. And then you have the online video service providers whose economics and models tend to be very different from the traditional um, live linear bookcase. Um, if you look at the motivations for each one of these, they're slightly different. Um, average selling prices in the encoding transcoding industry have plummeted. If there's any way to differentiate, if there's any way to have a margin right now, it's in HEVC. And so it is very, uh, very much a push market. It has always been a push market, but by raising the bar, they also enable new opportunities and new revenues. Um, for the online video service providers, they have a critical mass. They want to continue to gather that critical mass. Um, you know, TV everywhere is a buzzword. Subscription revenues are up. Um, pay TV satisfaction is down, but you have to continue to push that bar. Um, and as your volumes get larger and your audiences get larger and more distributed, the OPEXs start to matter a lot more, and you want to reach more and more of the world. Not all of them are broadband connected. So um, that's where the motivation comes in. For the pay TV service providers, again, you know, they have limited bandwidth, limited infrastructure. They want to send 4K. They want to grow their channels. They want to improve their quality. HEVC is a good way to do that. And for C device manufacturers, they're already at 3 and 4% margins. How do you start to differentiate again? HEVC and 4K is a good way to do that. So um, last year, we had made a few predictions um, in terms of you know, how HEVC is going to roll out. Um, there was quite a bit of buzz and hype and urgency around 2012 when the standard was finalized, sort of you know, a leap towards let's go off the cliff now. Um, we've been predicting a more phased approach. Um, and fortunately for me, um, a lot of those predictions have um, been on target. So um, we have started to see you know, early apps like video conferencing or closed loop contribution um, be one of the first applications of HEVC that come to fruition. Um, low bandwidth VOD hasn't quite happened yet. It's still in trial. But with um, the LG and 3G, uh, LTE and 3G and 4G becoming more globally pervasive and with the costs of phones coming down, that, eco uh, that expected economics hasn't quite worked out. Um, what we've seen also is a lot of the 4K VOD services start to kick in, um, you know, at pilot level on limited clients, but they're starting to kick in, the content starting to be created. Um, we are seeing early um, DTT offerings start to emerge, where, uh, and we'll actually look at a real-life use case of that. We're looking at uh, DTH receivers applications start to go to trial. Um, Lollipop Android just announced support for HEVC. So a lot of these building blocks are starting to come into play. 
and um, we are expecting to see 4K DTH services, um, limited if not 24-7 channels, come up within the next year. So um, that brings us to 2014, um, that black line is where we are. And we're expecting to see sort of a slew of very mature HEVC products start to appear, maybe at NAB, but certainly by IBC next year. So um, it's baby steps, but we did see some key developments in 2014. The patent pool was announced, um, and as we've been predicting, you know, it wasn't draconian, it wasn't, you know, disruptive to the industry. There are no content licenses, the caps are moderate, the terms are reasonable. And so, you know, that's, that's one thing we can stop worrying about. We did see the first channels deployed, the first VOD services deployed, the first IP contribution systems deployed, and we'll look at the ROI analysis for all of those. Um, we are seeing HEBC being incorporated into next-gen DTT, um, and that's largely because of the um, OPEX efficiencies it offers in terms of ongoing utility costs. We'll look at those numbers as well. Um, to my surprise, and I will admit I hadn't expected this to happen so soon, um, we're starting to see quite a few power-efficient software decoders, um, many of which are giving four to six hours of HD playback with software on state-of-the-art mobile devices. So, um, you know, current generation tablets, phones, one generation back tablets and phones, mid-range to high range, um, they're doing fairly well. Um, you know, there's smart clocking in place, there's parallel threading in place, um, there are power management tools available, and the codec vendors are taking full advantage of that, making this quite feasible. So with that caveat, um, what's the value proposition of HEVC? It's really one of two things. Either you're doing more with what you have, or you're paying less for what you do. Um, and both of those have um, their own place in the broader ecosystem. If you're looking at 4K, um, if you're trying to extend SD or HD to um, bandwidth constraint scenarios, you know, you care about the um, improved resolution for bandwidth. Um, one important thing we're seeing is as online offerings become um, more ubiquitous, where you can get the same content from four or five different providers, the quality matters. And so the better quality you can deliver while still being profitable will ensure that users come back to you. Other factors will matter, such as your search and recommendation, your advertising quality. I mean, all of that matters, but the video quality is a big deciding factor. And so if you can deliver better quality within the infrastructure you have, you're going to have a more competitive service. Um, and then you have improved productivity. So I, there was a use case where the, um, the US military has a 512 kbps backhaul connection. If they can get HD video instead of SD video, um, they can do con ops much more effectively. So there's, there's an opportunity cost in terms of, you know, if you can get better video over the infrastructure you have, some things you can do better than you could do before. Um, there's also lower capex. Um, so, you know, um, if you're using half the bandwidth, your transmission costs are lower. Um, if you don't have to overflow into another multiplex because you can fit more into your satellite, your, your existing contract is cheaper. Um, ODD volumes are rising, you know, CDN costs are rising. I see a lot of folks, you know, sort of nodding your heads. So this, I mean, it's, it's the usual math. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you can slash your backhaul costs, that means you have cash freed up to do better things with R&D to invest in your business. And those things are starting to matter. So um, we had uh, an all black version of this slide last year where we were saying a lot of pieces have to fall into place for the services to happen. Um, what you're seeing highlighted in red are the pieces that are starting to come to fruition. Obviously, we have a long way to go before the end-to-end -end ecosystem is comparable to AVC, but we're starting to get there. Okay, so all of that said, what did 2014 look like um, for HEVC? Uh, less than 1% of encoders shipped were HEVC enabled. Okay, more, much more than that was HEVC capable. So if you have a software powered encoder, you can upgrade the software and make it HEVC, but the densities are different. So if you have an eight channel AVC encoder, it's going to turn into a one channel HEVC encoder, all right? Um, so the numbers are still very, very small. If you look at TV shipments, 7% were HEVC capable. Um, the lower ones are capable, not enabled, because very few of them are actually enabled today. Um, in terms of the CE device shipments, 33% or one out of three, you know, mostly high-end tablets and phones, were HEVC capable. But if you look at the total deployed footprint, the older generations were not. And so you only have about 15% that you could reach with an HEVC service today. The implication of that is AVC isn't going anywhere. So if you're planning to deploy HEVC, it's going to be in parallel, unless it's for something like 4K where all your units are going to be new units. 
that said, I mean, you know, HEVC is great. We all want to talk about HEVC. Where is it at the 50,000 foot level? It's a rounding error on the priority list. I'll be frank about that. Um, when we talk to CEOs, when we talk to CTOs of ME companies, they're worried about monetization. They're worried about protecting their content. They're worried about their workflows. They are not worried about transmission costs. And they're not worried about people they cannot reach right now. So HEVC is a forward-looking initiative. For 4K, it's an enabling initiative. For IP contribution, it's an operational initiative. But in the larger scheme of things, analytics and monetization matter way more than HEVC does. Okay, so um, with all of that done, now we get to talk about the fun numbers. Um, 4K has been going live. And I have um, the detailed data and models for all of these. Um, you know, if you'd like to go into a deeper analysis, just find me on Twitter or phone, email. Um, I've simplified a lot of the calculations in all these models to make them digestible. Um, but you know, there's, you can always adjust them as needed. So we've seen um, a lot of 4K services go live. Um, Netflix has it, Sony, of course, Amazon, Comcast. Um, YouTube's using VP9, but you know, it's still in the mix. If you account for the cost of building the playback application, which is about half of the total capex for any kind of new service to unmanaged devices, um, if you account for the transcoding and the transmission costs, but as, ignore the content licensing costs because they're all over the map. A lot of these services are actually with self-owned content. You would need about 100,000 transactions to break even. Um, that's not an unattainable number. Um, it's tempered somewhat by how many folks have 4K receivers and how many have the bandwidth to receive it. Uh, we were having a fairly interesting conversation in the lobby, you know, what bandwidth is 4K? So if you're doing 60 frames per second, it's probably 32 megabits. Um, you know, if you're doing 30 frames per second, 20 to 25 is the benchmark to get decent quality. If you can drop it to 20 to 24 frames per second, then you, know, you can go lower. But at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that you can actually deliver that video and that within that pool of accessible customers, you can get to break even numbers. Um, 4K live VOD for sports and cultural events has a much higher pay-per-view value. Um, accordingly, the break-even point is a lot lower, um, close to 17,000 transactions, and you would you know, break even on the event costs. Again, that's ignoring um, the content license costs, and it's also ignoring the receiver costs. So you know, if you were to factor in the cost of a 4K television there, the economics would make no sense. But if you assume that you're trying to reach um, you know, bandwidth-dense audiences who may already have 4K rendering capabilities, then this is a really good way to monetize content that you may already have. Um, again, you know, less than 200 HEVC encoders and transcoders have been sold to date. Almost all of them have been in calendar year 2014. But we know of at least 3x that in trial. And we're starting to hear a lot of 4K cameras, 4K workflows, 4K NLE start to go into place. So you can expect this number to rise. And this is the pocket where we're seeing the strongest short-term ROI. That's where a lot of the investment and energy is focused. Um, there are challenges. And um, you know there was a there was a fairly intense panel discussion earlier today on the challenges. This is a more numerical view at it. Um, less than ten percent of the global pay TV audience is capable of receiving four K OTT today. So um, you know you can compress more aggressively. Um, you can amortize your costs across HD and four K. Um, you can download rather than stream. If it, you know if you're doing a VOD model, that's probably going to work best for you. Of course, that won't work for live sports. We've also seen a lot of instances where it's pseudo closed loop. So you have you know tie-ups with local theaters, you have tie-ups with local stadiums, and you broadcast the 4K event there. You monetize it through tickets. So it brings the cost down, it brings the feasibility up, and that's a good way to get your feet in the water. Um, there, the other big problem is the lack of consistent decoder footprint. A lot of the 4K services today are limited to specific types of TVs or specific end user devices. There's good reason for that. Um, building the end app is really, really expensive. So you have um, you know, less than 4% of TVs. So what, we looked at the 7% number, which was HEVC capable. Less than 4% can actually receive HEVC serv um, 4K services today. Um, sure. Um, it varies. Like I said, um, Netflix, I think, is doing it at 16. Um, we had someone here who said they're doing it at 12. Um, in Korea, Umax is doing it at 32. Um, I'm doing it as uh, whatever the approximate ultra-high bandwidth is for that particular region. 
divided by the approximate availability in that particular region. So it's not, you know, if I said everyone above 25 megabits per second it would probably be 7%. If I said everyone above 10 megabits per second it would probably be 25, 30%. But, you know, the services vary and the bandwidths vary. So give or take, you know, this is a reasonable number to use. Um, Sorry, oh, here. So um, if you look at the number of deployed television sets, 4K is a rounding error. If you look at the number of new television sets, you know, you're in the low single digits. And so you can try to roll out services device by device. Um, you'll probably annoy um, all the Samsung customers if you only ship on Sony, but you'll double your rendering costs if you try to do on Sony and Samsung. And then if you try to tackle Vizio and Haie and you know, all the other TV manufacturers, it's going to get more expensive. So that's, you know, that's, that's the trade-off you have. Um, one approach that seems to be working well is decryption sticks. Um, you know, if you've got a mass service that you can broadcast successfully, um, if you can plug a stick into a TV, that's way cheaper than having a set-top box. It's much easier than requiring someone um, you know, to buy a specific brand of television. Um, the problem with that is, at some point, a living room has too many boxes, and so customers are starting to resent that. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it's an approach that has been shown to work. The other option is, of course, just to bite the bullet and do what Netflix does and, you know, ship and invest on every single um, device and build it and hope that they will come. Um, it's worked for some, it's failed miserably for others, but that's a trade-off that every business can make. Um, or you can just delay rollout until you have a critical mass of receivers in place. And so there's arguments to be made for all those options. Um, there is also a continued um, scarcity of content. More importantly, there's continued scarcity of advertising. Um, if you will imagine for me that you're watching this beautiful 4K immersive video, and then you cut to an HD resolution advertise, advertisement, right? Either you're going to display it on one fourth of the screen, or you're going to blow it up to 4K and it will look horrible. But either way, that's not doing you much good. Um, so you need to have, if you're going to be ad supported, a really strong inventory of really good quality ads. And that's one gap that we've seen so far. Um, you can also um, work with, uh, so the way that Umax did it, and I thought that was kind of interesting, is Umax bit the bullet and said, I'm going to create the content. But then all the Korean cable operators got together and subsidized the rollout. Um, and they've got enough content going to end users that the end users are incented to buy 4K TVs and a little stick that enables the decryption. So they bypassed all the set-top boxes, they brought the total cost of ownership for the operators much lower, and now you've got a positive feedback cycle that's feeding, um, the, the, that's feeding the 4K uptake in Korea. Um, Korea, of course, is a very, very heavily networked country, and so that model may not work for everyone. Um, but, you know, that's, that's something that's worked fairly well. At a production level, you're going to need a broad upgrade across cameras, backhaul, NLE, you know, the end-to-end -end workflow if you're going to have high-quality 4K content in. Um, I was talking to Amber Finn about a year ago, and they said, well, we have one problem with 4K. The logo insertion system is HD. And so, you know, if you have 4K all the way until there and then you throttle your video at the last minute, it's not doing you any good. You have to have it end-to-end. -end. Those costs are much harder to, you know, quantify and amortize, but that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, 4K bandwidth costs may be a challenge even with HEVC. You know, rates are going up. Um, and so the solution to that is improved monetization, which takes me back to the pre-HEVC conversation. Um, you know, monetization is the one challenge that pretty much everyone's still grappling with. All right, um, any questions? I know I've been rattling on. No one disagrees with me yet, really? Okay. Um, so this is HEVC at work and contribution and backhaul. And this is a beautiful application for HEVC because you have a totally closed loop app. Okay, You have one encoder that goes to the satellite, comes down from the satellite, and one decoder. Everything before that is AVC, everything after that is AVC. It's, this is this one tightly controlled loop that you can upgrade to HEVC. And why does doing that make sense? So if you look at the CapEx breakdown um, for upgrading that loop to HEVC, these are market average prices. Um, HEVC encoder prices for one HD channel today range from 30 to about 65, 70, depending on frame rate and latency and power and all that. Um, but the market average is about 45K. Um, the IRD is about one third of that, so 15K. And then you have professional services to integrate it and test it and get it running. Um, that's a total of 75K. Um, if you look at the bitrate savings, they're not half today. You know, it's closer to 33 to 34%.
But even with that and with your average satellite backhaul pricing, you can pay back the investment in two years. And from that point on, you know, the cost savings continue. Um, over time, HEVC is likely to get efficient at a much faster rate than ABC will be. So the cost at which your savings rise is quite high. Um, the only caveat to this is you want to look at alternatives to backhaul itself. If you have to use satellite, HEVC can give you really good savings. If you can switch to OTT, OTT by definition is about 100 times cheaper than satellite backhaul. So, you know, look at your options is what we've been saying and what we continue to say. But within the limitation of needing satellite backhaul, this is actually a pretty solid ROI. Um, you can get better ROIs if you go with a cheaper encoder that gives you the latency and quality you need, or if you go with a more expensive encoder that may give you much better bandwidth savings down the line. So there are parameters here as well. Uh, but the five-year ROI is about 200%, which is not shabby. And then, um, you know, as we talked about, there are opportunity benefits. So, you know, if you can do HD and sub 500 kbps, um, or if you can, you know, benefit from the improved video quality, then that's in the bank. There are converse considerations. Um, the rack space um, consumption of HEVC is much, much higher than ABC, partly because the standard itself is more complex, partly because the implementations are not as sophisticated. Correspondingly, the power consumption is much higher. So if you're on a truck, if you're in a flyby, um, you know, you have to be careful with the weight considerations, the power considerations, make sure it works for you. Latency is a problem sometimes, if not always. Um, very often you end up having to trade latency versus compression efficiency. So I've had folks tell me, yeah, if you need real time, you know, with sub 200, just use all iframes. Well, if you're using all iframes, you're not going to get you know, the 50 or the 40 or the 30%. Yes, thank you. Um, so, you know, be, be careful about that too. There are solutions that can deliver both. Um, usually what happens is the price tag is higher because there are so few and far between. You want to look at the residual, uh, residual value of your legacy equipment. So if it's software upgradable, there's no issue. If it's all hardware, that means you have to throw it away and start afresh. If it still has useful life on it, you know, that's a trade-off. And if you have a backhaul contract that doesn't expire for two years, then, you know, you're stuck paying that anyway. So. Um, that and then you know just look at alternatives such as OTT but um, nonetheless yeah um, the market average is 45k per HD channel um, I've seen prices as low as 30 I've seen prices as high as 80 but give or take 45 they're going to drop pretty quickly as the number of people who can serve the market goes up so I'm expecting it'll be down to about 40 next year and it should be down to 30 market average in two years As a VOD encoder? Sorry. Yes. 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 Yes, the state of the art of live HEVC encoders, I'm just repeating it um, for the video, the state of the art for live HEVC encoders, if you pay enough, is such that they can compete with the best VOD encoders, yes. At HD, if you're talking 4K live 60 frames per second, that's a different conversation, but at HD, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's why I have HD up there, because the 4K conversation is a different one, yes. Any other questions? Um, it's at least 6x that of HD. They're not cheap. Um, it, and the, the issue is also um, some of them are sold as software images, so the hardware costs are excluded. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's high. It's not cheap. All right, so this is, um, you know, given that we're at a streaming media venue, um, this isn't the most obviously applicable um, a case study, but it has parallels in terms of broadcast streaming. And so I'm going to run through it fairly quickly. This is a real life proposal from a, a broadcast transmission project in Africa, where they wanted to put in 40 transmission towers, each broadcasting 100 live HD channels. And they were trying to decide whether to do it in AVC or in HD. Um, and this is where the numbers uh, worked out. Excuse me. So it turns out that the capex for building a transmission tower, whether you're doing HEVC or AVC, is about the same. 
The HEBC encoders are much more expensive than the ABC encoders, but because you're using half the bandwidth, you save a lot on the multiplexers and the UPSs and the amplifiers and all that other good stuff. Um, the transmission tower cost itself in terms of the constructing the antenna remains the same. But the OPEX savings start to target the millions of dollars, um, partly because power is fairly expensive in these countries, partly because you have a number of towers. This is in Africa. This is in Africa, so the quality is not comparable to what we would be using in a typical contribution application in a major market. So um, their issue here was, you know, they're used to SD. HD itself is, is fairly big. And because this was a volume deal, that is what they priced it at. Uh, yeah, so the um, X264 was about 4K per channel, and the HEVC was about three times that rounded down. Yes. Yes, and in this case, the type of content was such that they were actually getting it. I mean, if you had, you know, high motion sports, you probably wouldn't for the type of programming. This is what it was. Um, this is a hypothetical example. Um, I should clarify, this is not Star Times Research's, um, you know, published price list. Um, this is their model with my market average pricing thrown in. Yeah, don't, don't call them and ask for this pricing. You won't get it. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you look at the other side of the economics, every household needed to have a new HEVC receiver. Um, those are, you know, quite fabricable at $50 each. So the OPEX savings that you would have in the first year would balance out the um, decoder distribution costs. And from that point on, you have a much more efficient transmission system. Um, what also happens in Africa is that the power is not reliable. So they have diesel generators running each transmission station. Um, ergo, you're pretty sure your um, utility, co utility costs will rise over time. Um, the less they are, the easier it is for you to do. But um, the reason I bring this up is, you know, if you have um, an origin server that's starting to serve millions of people, um, you know, a lot of the economics start to look similar. All right, so then we're at the um, fun use case, which is HEVC at work and file-based OTT. So this would be, um, you know, a service like Netflix or like Hulu or Amazon, where you have a bank of content that you're streaming OTT to users. Um, I'm not really including encoding or transcoding utility costs or overhead here because it's file-based, so you can amortize it any way you want. Um, but typically, uh, again, you know, simplified use cases, but typically we're seeing six hours of HD video consumption per household per week. Um, that's where the math works out. Um, I'm assuming about five cents per GBPS delivery charges. It could be more, it could be less, depending on, you know, what kind of last mile uh, agreements you have, what kind of bulk agreements you have. You know, the number could go up or down, but ballpark, this works fine. So essentially for this hypothetical service, you know, they're paying $12 million in delivery costs in one year in 2014. So what happens to the OPEX as you start to transition to HEVC? Um, this is a fairly humongous spreadsheet. Um, I'm happy to email it to anyone who wants to play with the numbers, but what I've assumed is for the same number of subscribers, I'll just give me your business card. Um, for the same number of subscribers, I'm assuming constant growth in content consumption. I'm assuming moderate growth in AVC compression efficiency. I'm assuming much faster growth in HEVC compression efficiency. Um, I'm assuming that the percentage of HEVC enabled households is moving from a rounding error in 2014 to about 20% 20 in 2019. And that's what all the other costs are modeled off of. Um, you could argue in advanced markets, you might get a 25 or 30% sooner. I know we were having that discussion um, in the corridor earlier. You could argue in you know, countries like India where bandwidth matters the most, none of them will have HEVC. And that's, I think you know, it, it takes one disruptive device to move that needle up or down. But this is ultimately what the economics work out to. You're, you're probably going to save $2 per household in transmission costs by upgrading to HEVC. Yes. Yes. So the other way that you can look at it is um, if you wanted to continue to grow quality 
and still keep your costs controlled. And um, you know, we can run a different model that way too. It's you know, it's we're plugging numbers into a spreadsheet. Yes, yes, exactly. No, so um, if you look at the light blue line, I don't know how visible it is. Um, that's the percentage of households that are being served with HEVC. Um, I don't know if I can use the mouse here. No. Okay, so the light blue line that goes from 0 to 20%, that's the percentage of households served with HEVC. There's no way that you can disconnect the ABC workflow um, if you want to reach your target audience. Correct. You, so you'll have to bite the bullet of having parallel workflows, but at least um, you know you can save on transmission costs. My point, though, is you're not saving you know a spectacular amount of money on transmission costs. Now, where this analysis breaks down is if you were to use HEVC to deliver video service to a whole new set of subscribers who didn't have it before. So let's say this service provider went from 1 million subscribers to 1.5 million subscribers because those additional half a million were using all HEVC, then the model changes completely. You've got 50% of people using HEVC. You've got a way larger subscriber count. That's a different model. But all other things being constant, just switching to HEVC, the point here is it's not going to save you um, a whole lot. Yeah, if you brought that down to half, the whole model would drop by half. But it, it, it affects both proportionally. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, yes, you're right in that if you could negotiate a better carriage deal, you'd s drop costs much more effectively than if you tried to switch to HEVC. Because the costs would drop for your entire viewer base versus those who had HEVC. So in the base year, I'm taking 33%. I'm assuming that rises to 50% by 2019. Um, it's the, the rate I've used is a little bit slower in the beginning because ABC is also getting better. But at some point, ABC will peak out and then HEVC will continue to get better. Any other questions? All right, so um, opportunity cost does matter. And you know, to your point, if you can have better video quality within the same capacity, you know that's an argument to be made. Um, if you can keep up with growing content volume, so I've assumed a steady 10% growth in volume. What happens if volume goes up 30%, 50%? Um, you know, maybe your costs rise much faster unless you can bring your capacity down. Um, you know, what happens to your end consumers if they start to hit their bandwidth caps or the data consumption caps? You know, is there value to bringing that down? Those aren't really measured here. Um, Again, on the converse side, you will have increased rack space consumption. Um, you know, one of the number one concerns that operators um, tell us they have when they're trying to serve OTT volume is they don't have physical space to host more transcoders, which is why they're pushing everything into the cloud. Well, today there is no HEVC in the cloud; it's all on-premise. So, um, you know, you kind of have to keep that in mind. Um, there will be increased app development costs. HEVC is not ubiquitous today; it's unlikely to be uniformly ubiquitous within the next three to four years. And so you're going to have to eat for every platform you want to target, um, you know, 100K to 250K, depending on the complexity and app development costs. Um, you will have to have parallel workflows. Um, ABC isn't going away, not even by 2020. Um, and for now, at least, there's the inability to overflow into the cloud. So um, just to wrap everything up, um, you know, these are the typical caveats to ROI. Certainly look at the encoder costs, certainly look at the bandwidth savings, but consider the actual compression efficiency that matters in the context of the latency and what frame rate you're using. So if you're getting, you know, a 20% increase in, frame, in bit rate, but you're going from 24 frames per second to 60 frames per second, then there may be value to that for you. Um, look at density rack space considerations. Um, look at peak load management. A lot of companies have invested in bursting their workflows into the cloud. A lot of that will break if you do HEVC. So you have to be careful with that. Um, you know, again, advertising servers, you know, just the end-to-end -end workflow components. Um, look at the decoder footprint. You know, we've quantified some of that. And then um, the costs of having parallel workflows at least for a while. So um, are there any questions so far before I switch gears here? I have, let me table that just for the next two slides and then I will get back to that. 
All right, so um, we've talked about the operator perspective um, you know, for this presentation. I want to take a few minutes and talk about the vendor perspective. So if you're an encoder, transcoder vendor, what are the four things you can do to make this ecosystem come to life for the rest of us? The first thing is we need real-time HD and 4K encoders. We need them to be faster. We need them to be lighter. We need them to be cheaper. We need them to be denser. That's the game that's going to be played over the next couple of years. Um, and we are expecting at some point, even though it's a rounding error now, you're going to see like a tripling, quadrupling of encoder sales, and it's going to be sudden. Um, it's probably going to be sooner than we're predicting it will be, just as we saw with ABC, but there'll be one disruptive device or service that comes out and everyone will jump on the bandwagon. You know, if Apple tomorrow decides it's going to support HEVC, or if the HBB TV standard comes out and mandates HEVC, you know, something's going to jump and then everyone will want to get on board. If you have a workable product at that point, you'll be golden. Power efficient decoders are another major requirement. Um, you know, as we said, the, the software decoders are getting better four to six hours on high-end devices, but what about the low-end devices? What about the feature phones? What about, you know, all the other um, television sets and streaming devices out there? So that's, that's still an issue. Um, complete solutions is probably the single most important thing right now. Um, there isn't a healthy ecosystem of interoperable HEVC vendors. So if you're going to go in, go in with a system integrator mindset. Make it work from end to end. Customers are interested. Um, and then finally, as a, uh, as a community, you, know, you need more end-to-end -end showcases, very similar to what we did with ABC. You know, just get as many components in the ecosystem working as you can, and that starts to set the tone, um, set the tone for mainstream adoption. So we're still you know, on the very early curve. If you want to go up the slope, you're going to need that mature ecosystem. So um, these are the recommendations. Let me go back to VP9 um, real quick, and I think we'll still have uh, a few more minutes for questions. So what's happening with VP9 and VP10 is that Google is a three-headed monster, at least from what I've been told. So there's the Chrome ecosystem, there's the Android ecosystem, and there's the rest of Google. Um, Android has come to the conclusion that they're going to have to unite under one particular umbrella, and it's clear that VP9 or VP10 is not going to be that umbrella. Um, when I talk to OVPs, when I talk to um, transcoding vendors, when I talk to content owners, they like VP9 in theory, but no one's using it. Um, YouTube is using VP9 for sure, um, but outside of that umbrella, it's, it's not clear. Like, even um, some of the video conferencing products that Google has are based on ABC versus VP9 and VP10. So is it going to continue to be interesting for sure, um, but is it going to be adopted en masse? Probably not. At least we're not seeing any indication today that that will happen. Um, it's not being considered for any of the standards. Um, you know, if, if there's something that's Google specific, it does play a role, but otherwise, it's it's not. And it may or may not be in Lollipop. I'm assuming it's in Lollipop. I don't have a confirmation of who the vendor is, so I'm not sure. Um, with uh, HEVC, I actually spoke to the vendor, so I know it's in there. I'd be very surprised if it's not in Lollipop. I mean, I would very much expect it to be there. Uh, but again, it's the question is the decoder may be there, but who's using it? And, you know, we're just not seeing the content volume rise in proportion to what overall content consumption is rising. So in terms of other summaries, um, you know, ROI will vary depending on whether you're doing greenfield or whether you're doing upgrade. And you want to think about the fact that it's not 50% today, but it will get there. And that, you know, you you're not going to be able to reach all your consumers, at least for the foreseeable future. So factor those things in, and we've looked at some use cases. Um, the other interesting takeaway for vendors is that the promise of HEVC is triggering a shift away from hardware, finally, towards more software form factors. And that may be a MPEG-4 or an AVC software encoder today, but you want to be able to upgrade it to HEVC moving forward. So, an unintentional consequence of the emergence of HEVC is a shift in preference from hardware encoders to software encoders. Um, we are seeing growth in real-time encoding and decoding. Um, prices are very high today if you want you know, high-performance material, but those prices are going to fall quickly as more people join the bandwagon. Um, and then finally, you know, as we've always been saying, I'll continue to say this, look at all your options when you're evaluating HEVC. If you can switch to OTT, if you can use a cheaper backhaul, um, you know, if you can negotiate lower CDN costs, you'll get much more bottom line benefit than you will by switching to HEVC. And with that, um, those are our three final predictions. Um, I'll leave them up. They're sort of self-evident. Um, are there any other questions?
anything you'd like to discuss so a lot of the cp that we're seeing go out even north american cable is dual format today it's mpeg2 and mpeg4 so what we're seeing is um Outside of, you know, maybe China and India, some parts of Africa where it's very, very cost sensitive, um, those boxes that are shipping this year are pure MPEG-2, but even they are expecting a refresh to a next generation box that's not just a zapper within a couple of years. So once the current generation phases out, and it should be within four years, um, it's very unlikely that you'll have a box on the ground that doesn't have ABC support. And then, you know, that the idea is that if you've got HEVC coming down the road, it starts to push MPEG-2 out. Um, today, if you look at it, um, most of the encoding vendors, especially the well-entrenched ones, are making um, a pretty good amount of their revenue from MPEG-2 encoders, but an increasing percentage of those are reconfigurable to become ABC encoders. So, you know, the stage is being set for the transition. The question is just when it's going to kick in. Um, and our, our expectation is that as HEVC hits critical volume, there will be grow, um, there will be lowered interest in trying to sell MPEG two. Does that make sense? Any other questions? All right. Well, um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I will here. Let me do this real quick. Oh shoot! Sorry, I should have done this. I want to thank all the companies who took the time um, to talk to me. Um, there's a wide variety of participants up there, as you can see, um, and that broad coverage is fairly critical to the amount of um, coverage we can provide and to the accuracy of our predictions. So thank you to those companies. And um, this is uh, our contact information if you need to reach us. Thank you. Thank you.